Is this going to happen? Okay, now I think it, well, from here on in, there'll be something. <laughs> All right, let's start over. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, and you're not transformed. You're going to get your way, and now you're all upset. You want both. You want the talk on the tape, and you want new stuff. I says, you can't have, so you can't have the world that you want. You have the world that you have in many situations. <laughs> but the, the, the one world that you can change is you, or can have change, is you becoming who someone else wants you to be and not who you're supposed to be, which is what I start out with. That's the one world that I think is worth working on. Change, get, allowing yourself to be changed. That's what the recovery program is really. Is. Letting yourself be changed by doing certain steps and things as opposed to changing me by just willing it. I said, that's not so easy. Uh, so it's a lot of surrender, it's a lot of letting go, and so on and so forth, like that. So the Benedictine lifestyle is to be able to carry this through, uh, to keep that the mindfulness of that uh, he's talking about is keeping one's consciousness alive to the present moment, the awareness of the present moment. And sometimes the present, so for instance, say this monk was more uh, like me. Uh, so the, the machine breaks. Now I've got fear. Suddenly fear came up. That was my go-to emotion. Fear. What's the fear? Well, I'll look bad because someone will look out and see the field is dry. Why, did, why is the field dry? Your job is to make it green so cows can eat. So that would be one thing. How you see me. Uh, and then the next thing is, oh, there will be grass for the cows to eat. This green part, they'll finish that, and they can't get this, who knows when the part's going to come. Cows have nothing to eat. Uh, cows go away. Cows die. You know, there's no reason. The cows are skinny. The cows go good. And uh, not that I never think about the cow being slaughtered. That would cross my mind. <laughs> or or we're not, we don't eat meat, but we got all these cows <laughs> grazing. I mean, it's uh, any case. So, um... You become aware, oh, oh, that's, that's fear. Oh, I, oh, oh, I don't have to let that control me. And that monk didn't let fear control him. He might have had the thought. But he's learned to let it go over a period of many years at the monastery. So um, when our heart is calm, uh, we don't tend to ask ourselves, let's see if the heart is calm, that innards are a certain, a certain level of calmness. You'll stop asking yourself, am I doing this right? Someone will say, here's a method for spiritual practice. You know, give me a method. Give me four steps, A, B, C, so on and so forth. I mean, even uh, Siddhartha figured this out after he had been invited to this. And these are Easterners, they need steps. Something. There's, there's an eightfold path, not just, well, learn to live your life. It's an eightfold path. Here's the eightfold path. There's the four noble truths. There's the 12 steps of AA. I mean, we, a lot of us, we got to have steps to get rolling and all. Uh, so you've got this idea that comes to you am I doing this right? Well, okay, so that hopefully that's early on. And, let it go. And the way you let it go is you're not doing anything. In all these, uh, the commonality of all these practices to become more meditative or to allow the mystical uh, level to take over in your life, the sense of oneness and union, uh, the sense of compassion for the world around you, or the sense of letting go of your craziness and all that stuff like that. That, that you, you will move beyond, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? says, everything is upon me to get to this next level. This is a process where the only thing that's upon you is showing up and stopping and attempting a practice that works for your particular way. Uh, however you get into beginning the process of letting go of your 
monkey mind. Uh, so you may start out saying, am I doing this right? That's okay. But just to know, you don't do it. You let it be done to you. Uh, so there is a power and energy, uh, but nothing that can be identified. And I think this is how uh, uh, Buddhists, the Hindus have many gods, but not when they get into the deeper dimension of what they call meditation, deep meditation we would call contemplation. In the Western tradition, you don't contemplate. You meditate, but it's the power of God brings you into the contemplative level. You don't go there yourself. Well, what's the contemplative level? For example, I do all the time. You sit there, you've got your watch set, your clock, or your device for a half hour. You sit down and bing it, the bell goes off, and you have no idea that you were sitting there for a half hour. Totally unaware of awareness. That's the contemplative moment. And uh, you'll find that your day begins to go better because of what happened. Because, in other words, God was at work. Uh, and you weren't. But you showed up. And it doesn't always happen. They happen rarely with people. But uh, uh, any practice, any attempt will get you to a, a deeper level. That is, you begin to deal with your stuff that gets in the way. You begin to see it. You begin to let it go. Uh, because you learn how to detach it's one of the things that Buddhism talks about, detachment. Like as well as suffering, a lot of it has to do with our attitude. Uh, but especially in a third world place that Thich Nhat Hanh lived in, yes, a lot of suffering, you know, public toilets, and running water, and sinks, and so on and so forth, and that a lot of that stuff. So, uh, learn detachment. It's not easy, but that's what the contemplative, that's what the meditative method is trying to do. So we don't practice contemplation, we can practice meditation. When it gets to a certain level, another power took over, and it wasn't me. And that's pretty consistent. Uh, so that's why he talks about being mindful of the now. Is that all? Because he knows that at some point, you'll be in a place where you're not even aware of being aware for that time. And remember, those guys will sit for quite a long time, a couple of hours at a different time. But they, they're trained to do that, those monks. Um, so am I doing it right is a beginner's kind of thing. Uh, but uh, after a while, isn't it nice to know that there's no wrong way? It's one of the few things. There's no wrong way. Uh, the wrong way is to skip it. Uh, and what a lot of people do there's probably more people who used to do century prayer than actually do it. I, I run into any number of people who say, I used to do century prayer. Or a few less, I used to, I used to do Zen. Well, I say, and what do you do now? Well, I don't do anything. In other words, well, what happened? Well, at some point, they didn't get their agenda. And they weren't getting what they wanted, even though you keep telling them, because uh, this is a long process. They didn't get what they wanted. Well, I know more about century prayer, let's say. So, for instance, they read a book that, that written by somebody who talks about how really nice this thing is working out, how it's changing their life, the wonderful feelings that they have. So I've read these books. And I said, wow, I want that too. I like that. And here's what you do. So Thomas Keeney comes along and says, here's what you do. Uh, and, uh, okay, I'm going to practice that. And you have some good feelings initially. And you feel pretty good. So, ah, I'm an adept. I've been in it three weeks. I'm an adept. <laughs> <laughs> and then the pink cloud goes, if you will. And you no longer, it's not so, uh, it's a bit trying. It's harder to get there. Uh, and uh, uh, for any number of reasons. And so you, or it doesn't feel as good as it used to feel. Well, we know, I know in my tradition that's called the dark night. And I just said darkness is not a bad thing. God does God's best work there. But we're, we're feeling not so good about it. 
It's not, it's not lovely. Um, and it's, it, I think what it is, is it's the effort of this power, this energy, this holy mystery, if you will, saying, okay, you're in this Terry Ryan because it's making you feel good. Well, I love you unconditionally. I'd like to know what your stake is in it. Do you love me unconditionally? And of course, my thought is, no, I don't. I only love you as long as I get what I want. I mean, that's, that's why I'm a Catholic. <laughs> you know it works. Uh, the ultimate is to get to heaven, but the rings they burn. I mean, that's why I'm here. <laughs> so, or whatever it is. Uh, so, you get all this good feeling seems to be removed. And uh, it's, it's, it's a waste of time. Why do you try harder? Because you think maybe it's being there for us. No, this is a waste of time. It's an absolute waste of time. And then you find, well, you know, find, then you just drift back into whatever you were before you started this practice. But you gave it up, and you just go on living your selfish, self centered life. Uh, so I think there's always going to be, in any tradition, no matter what it is, east, west, there's going to be, in a mystical prayer, there's going to be, early on, good, uh, and then, not so good, uh, as, as uh, let's say you're being tested to see if you're going to stay with it. How much surrender are you going to get? You're going to surrender your agenda? Uh, for feeling good. Is feeling good why you do things? Well, you're not going to become much of a selfless person if that's what your prayer is all about. So I'll, you know, people will say to me, I was bored. There any religious practice. And they'll say, I'll say, why did you stop? I'm curious. And so I don't I condemn you. Why did you stop often? I'm bored. In other words, it started out uh, either because they were dragged there by their parents uh, or taken there by their parents. It's one of the many things that they do as children. You're going to go to Catholic school. They don't ask a six-year-old, would you like to go to Catholic school? Or would you prefer Montessori? <laughs> would you like? Do you want to be an artist, a painter? Or would you like to be a STEM person, a science, technology, engineering? Because as a painter, you may live in my basement as a STEM person, you can get a job. I don't want you to go to Montessori. You may become a painter. You're going to St. Sacred Heart of Jesus because they're going to teach you how to train and to make a living. So there you go. And you go to church. Well, you go to church because they drag you there. They take you. It's one of the things you do. You go to church, you listen, you like that, so on and so forth. And you learn to look like you're paying attention because the teachers are watching. They're the person next to you. They make sure that certain people don't sit with certain people. And so on and so forth. And I see all this stuff. So, and then you get your sacraments, uh, one by one. You go to confession, the first communion, the confirmation. You get some gifts, so it looks pretty good. And uh, then at some point, you get a choice. You get a choice. And you say to yourself, I'm born. And you didn't ask that question so much when you had to do it. But later, when you don't have to do it, that's when you, this option comes up, I'm born. I'm not getting what I want. And uh, even though the priest is preaching about the cross and sacrifice and let go, and, and I'm not getting that. Yeah, this is boring. So you stop. And then I say to someone, what did you do when you did, now that you're not doing that, what do you do? I ski. <laughs> I hike, I run, I uh, work, I do everything, so on and so forth. OK. See me when you're 50. <laughs> because that's when the emptiness begins to come in. Not that those things weren't fulfilling. They were fulfilling for a while. But there's so much more of us. I think we're, we're just sort of naturally called to this deep delight. Uh, I, I see it in, um, in uh, such things as, well, one of the best spiritual programs in the Western world in the 20th century was Alcoholics Anonymous. It started in 1935 with their 12 steps and all. And you see a number of people uh, more people used to go to AA than actually go. Uh, but a lot of who used to go to AA died miserably. But um, 
what happens is they start out, they get something that they want, they stop drinking, uh, their lives aren't so crazy, you know, spouse doesn't divorce them, or they don't get fired, or they do, but something happens, and then they don't stay with it uh, for whatever reason. And uh, they drop out, and their lives start to slide down. Uh, I, uh, oh, it's the same old, same old. They just talk about the same old stuff. And uh, <laughs> what stuff they talk about? They talk about the mess of your life, which you don't want to hear about it anymore. <laughs> uh, but whatever it is, and one of the things I find that is the switch in AA, which is why I know it's a spiritual program, is because people go into AA out of desperation to get something, sobriety. And they will go to those meetings to keep from killing themselves or to keep from their fear-based lives or whatever. And at some point, if they keep going, they switch to service. And that's why I know it's a spiritual program. They switch to service. It's my job to go now to help others. They don't care what they do. It's boring. They don't even ask that question. Can I do something for someone in this meeting somehow? Maybe talk to them afterwards. Maybe I saw them another time. I'll talk to them ahead of time. Let's get together. Give me a phone number. Let's have a cup of coffee. That's the switch. And what I find in a lot of institutional churches is they go to get something. And as long as they think they're getting it, they're fine. But they don't switch over to service, which is why uh, in, in many um, churches, there's very little volunteerism. Whereas AA doesn't function without volunteerism. It's all volunteerism. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's what you're going to begin to see in a more contemplative practice, is you begin to participate more selflessly in your world. You do things. You now are able to do some things because you really like them. Billy Joel. Okay. I brought that up. You're able to do, first of all, you're able to do that. You're able to say, this is me. I don't care what you think, so to speak. And because if you've got a spiritual program, that's not selfish. Uh, but on the other hand, then you're able to do some things uh, that aren't all about you. That you are not the focus of attention. That you try to be of service to others. And you try to be of service to others not so that the results will turn out like you want, but so that you'll stay on the path. A lot of people will be of service for a while, and then they'll say, it's all a waste of time. Nothing changes. And I said, what about, did you change? Did you become a better person? If that happened, then it was worthwhile. Uh, so you move to do things, not so it'll, that'll work out the way you want. Uh, so I'm going to work in a soup kitchen, so that I'll make all these street people happy. They're just drunks and alcoholics and drug addicts and lazy and worthless. Of course, you made all that judgment, right? So, But you're going to go and make them happy by giving them a bowl of soup. And when they're not happy and you give them a bowl of soup, you say, it's not worth it. It's not changing them. And I said, that wasn't the point. It didn't change you. Uh, so are you serving the soup to change you, or are you serving the soup to change them? If you're serving the soup to change you, you will deal with yourself, including all your judgments you made about those people. So you begin to just take a whole new way of life. I mean, I look at uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, I say, okay, he took on these, uh, these losers. You know, I judge that. They don't lose it. People like me took them on. So, uh, and they didn't change. They didn't change. <laughs> they didn't get any better. Uh, most of them. Some of them never heard about it afterwards. He says, well, tradition has it. I said, well, okay, maybe you did. Whatever. <laughs> but um, they didn't seem to change. But that was who he is. And so he just kept on. And not judgmental, unconditional love, forgiving, challenging, and so on and so forth. So you keep being who you are because it's who you are, and you want to be the best of who you are. And if people around you don't change, that's not your job. Our job is not to change others, it's to change ourselves. And we are service to others to change ourselves. We have to give up this idea that the world will be a better place for them because I'm doing something. 
You don't know that. But you do know that you need to do it. As far as anybody knows, except the believers, we believe this, is that Jesus was executed on the cross, and that's it. He died a loser. It's what it looks like to a lot of people. Um, and he, um, he had that experience. Um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was that sense of complete, utter absence. And he was just talking in John's Gospel. I and the Father are one. I said, wow, mystical experience. I and the Father are one. We are one. And I am in you, and you are in me. We're all one. We're all one. Wow. He's got it. He's deep mystical. He's on the cross. He's, hey, where are you? I mean, that's a deep darkness. But what do you say after that? Into your hands I commend my spirit. In other words, he was aware of this uh, utter sense of absence. And it was into that darkness that he surrendered himself. And, and that's a transformed person. And that's going to be a resurrected person. Uh, and whether any of us or all of us get there or not, but he did say, follow me. And uh, I don't think it was in terms of changing uh, water into wine, uh, uh, or any of the other things, feeding 5,000 people with a couple of loaves of bread, and so on and so forth. So it's just keeping in mind, we have these instances. The, in, the, in Buddhism, uh, there are the adepts who say, I am, not, I am not going to try to enter nirvana, blown out. So just, I am going to stay on this side of it, to help other sentient beings, they call them, to experience this, uh, or to know, or to have some sense that this is the way, this is the, this is the practice of our life. So that's service. That's being of service. But it comes out of their deep mystical practice. And when they serve, does everybody become that? No. I mean, when you stop and think about it, there's so many people will say in the Eastern tradition, I'm a Buddhist. So I used to think that means you meditate. It's sort of like someone saying, I'm a Christian because they were baptized as a baby. That's about it. Uh, they don't do anything. They're not sitting in meditation. They just, I'm a Buddhist. And a lot of it would have to do with ancestor worship, which you don't have to be a Buddhist to do. But they say, well, Buddhists have this, uh, you know, they do this too. But the adepts know, we're not about ancestors. Uh, it's part of our culture, and our culture is Buddhist, but there's something much deeper. So the West would often say we are a Christian culture. I don't think the Jews like to hear that too much, but um, uh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't see too many people being like Jesus. Uh, so not too many people being like Buddha in the East, but it's there. You, you, you just can offer it and, and uh, offer it and, and see where it goes, but it's not your job. Um, so, think of it, an example he uses um, is a pebble. He said, a pebble falls into the river, and the river's <coughs> moving. The river's constantly moving, let's say. And the pebble falls into the river, and falls into this flow of the river. Um, and uh, it sinks. Because that's what pebbles do. Little by little, it sinks. It has no intention of guiding the river. The river is just going to do what rivers do. But it's going, its intention is just to be a pebble, which will sink uh, until it rests in the bed of the river. And then the river can move all over above it. But below, there's not much movement at all. So it's as if on the surface, and we are part of the river, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you're sort of getting carried along. In many ways in our lives we get carried along, we use that term, uh, and bounced around. But with a more contemplative practice, we sort of sink into our center. And there we are at rest. Surrounded by a world of activities, good, bad, or indifferent, and uh, we are part of it, but we, we become an example 
to the agitation all around us of, of another approach to life, become like the pebble. Um, so a life of constant focused worry and a life of constant action does not fit into mindfulness. Uh, and a lot of it is our own agenda. So we learn to be, we become examples. And I think it's one of the best ways to, uh, to be of service is the example of your life as you begin to practice uh, deep in prayer. The example of your life will begin to show up and other people will say things like, you don't seem as angry as you used to be. Uh, you don't seem as controlling as you used to be. I sense a certain amount of peace in you. Thich Nhat Hanh says, when you wake up in the morning, try a half smile. <laughs> and as you go through the day, ask yourself if you've got that half smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> so, you you become an example just by the way you live your life for people around you. Now, does that mean you're going to change? Touch your job. But at worst, even though you don't become contemplatives, if you will, uh, they will have the example of what it's like to live a bit of a transformed life, as opposed to the agitated, worried, controlling, self-centered, uh, person uh, that you were. Uh, and uh, people in, uh, go back to the 12-step programs, people will say, for instance, oh, uh, you, uh, you're as crazy as you used to be. What happened? <laughs> and they'll say something, well, I, uh, I started going, I started going. Well, you would say, well, I started meditating. Does it mean after meditating? No, but, oh, what do you do? Do you go someplace? Yeah, I go someplace. Where do you go? Would you like to come? That's all you have to do. Is it would you like to come? And that's what you do. You begin to, uh, your life just changed is one of the best examples. So uh, two people could be, again, the soup kitchen. Two people could be serving soup, and one has a certain way about it. And the other is just crazed. Uh, and. And I find that people are more attracted to the one who's consistent and seems to have a little bit of central peace. Well, around them is all this uh, consternation and stuff like that. Uh, because the consternation's going to go on. But sometimes, we just buried a woman. Uh, actually, I don't think she's physically buried yet, but <laughs> so, her, name, her name was, uh, well, her name still is Agnes Stuff. She used to be alive. Uh, and Agnes was this person who uh, ran a uh, little food bank, little big store food bank up at St. Thomas Aquinas years ago when they had this food bank. Before they got harvest to open, try to combine everybody. And uh, there were, first of all, the people who would come there to eat or whatever, who were basically people who lived on the streets so or very low income people. Many of them did not have many social skills, let's say, okay? They didn't have social skills. They weren't well bathed or well groomed, uh, mostly men. And uh, uh, they were kind of used to dealing with people who didn't want to deal with them, but maybe had to, or people who dealt with them with judgment. So they would go to government agencies. And they weren't going to change to get better. So these agencies say, we'll help you and you'll get better. So on and so forth. So, Agnes was the kind of person, and I, I wouldn't say that you know she was a great contemplative. I don't know, but her attitude was that she was unconditionally loving and accepting of you, uh, but she wasn't going to put up with bad behavior. But the way she was with people. Let them calm down because they knew that she cared and she made no judgments about them and she was attentive to them as individuals. You know, many of the names 
And they could not just come to the food bank and line up and get something to go. They could hang out as long as the place was open. They just hang out. And she had a certain calmness and acceptance, and yet a certain sense of, we have some protocol here. But it wasn't, you better shape up. It was the way she was that gave them the permission to be in, on their best behavior while she was there. And so I think that becomes someone who is showing through her life what it's like, uh, how you can deal with, be with, not deal with, but be with, enter into the lives of other people. Did these men sober up and get off the streets? I don't know that Agnes asked that. Even demand that she would have given up a long time ago if that was her goal, because many of these people never did. Or uh, I mean, AA would give up if it said, "Well, what if only 10 percent of the drunks in the world in, in the United States got even involved in alcoholics?" So these 90 percent never even come. And what if a very small percentage of those ever got sober and stayed sober, stayed sober, died sober? Well, they looked at the percentages, they would get up. Uh, but they don't. They don't do it that way. That's where they're going to go on and on and on. And that's where they're going to survive, uh, I think. And they're willing to adapt. I, I compare AA to churches. If you don't adapt and change, you are dead. That's what's going to happen. You are on the way out. And they started out as alcoholics. Very few people are alcoholics alone, they use the alcoholic drug addicts. And so people will talk about both, and there was some consternation about that, and then there's finally some acceptance. It's the way it is. People have both. There is NA, Narcotics Anonymous, uh, but a lot of people come to AA, they got both. And uh, so that's just the way it is. Uh, so I think there's a certain amount of adaptation goes on. And now there are many more workshops on 11th step, spirituality, people getting involved in deeper meditations, uh, much more so than way early on when it started. So uh, I think this mindfulness is the thing to keep in mind um, that helps us to take the prayer and our active life together. Because mindfulness of our breath is something that's in both sides, active and meditative. Uh, and relaxation, stay on this issue of service, relaxation is not the goal. It's the point of departure, is what Thich Nhat Hanh would say. It's not the goal. So you realize, a, a way of looking at relaxation, you realize a tranquil heart and a clear mind. What does a clear mind mean? It means I never have any negative feelings, antagonistic. No, it means clear. Well, you may get to that. But on the way, clear means you don't let the energy of any of those thoughts control you. That's what starts getting clear. You let that second wave of, of uh, being kinder, more loving, more accepting, more compassionate come on. And you have a tranquil heart, clear mind, and that's what you take into your actions of this is what I think people like Dick Nhat Hanh began to offer of Buddhism in the West. Was Buddhism is service. Not the sense of, well, life's miserable. You just try to uh, uh, get to nirvana. You can't change any of this mess. There'll be reincarnation, karma. Maybe you'll come back better. Uh, but he and monks like him were bringing this sense, and I think that's how Buddhism, Buddhism is able to uh, adapt itself to the culture it enters. It has always done that eventually. So you talk about, I mean, Buddha uh, was in northern India, uh, but then Buddhism went to Japan, Buddhism went to China. Well, China's not Japan, Japan's not China, neither are in India. So they, and, became Zenish over in China, in Chan, I mean in, in Japan, Chan in uh, China. Uh, but it's Buddhism, but it adapts to the culture. And to the extent that Christianity could adapt to the culture, it was successful. To the extent that it tried to make people Westerners, European, Northern Europeans, it had more troubles. Uh, or you had more troubles if you didn't become like that. 
they exterminate you or enslave you or whatever. So um, you have this tranquil heart, clear mind, and you are able to then enter into the world of suffering. You just said the world's full of suffering, but you're able to enter into it, not to make it so much, uh, let's see, you don't enter into it so that your goal of making it better will happen because you don't know that. You enter into it because that's the energy that you have. And some of the people that will be well affected, you may never hear about. They may never say anything to you. And I've had that happen. I've had people come to me. Uh, I did a wedding a couple of years ago. And uh, somebody called me up. So, so I, I you know who they are. Uh, and they said, I used to go to thus and so place, and I remember you preaching, and I really liked what you said. And they would even remember it. I would remember it. They would remember it. And they said, I want to know if you'll do my way. Now there's where you realize you had an effect on somebody. Who, a little kid's not going to come up and say, uh, oh, Father, you really changed my life. And you don't have that kind of social skill by and large. Uh, they, they might say, oh, Father, we love your whatever. But most of them would say nothing, because you're an adult and country you know, column on some different authority, but they know better. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that's one of the So you may never know. You may never know the effect that you have on a lot of people. But you don't need to know. You just need to be the best you that God made you to be. And I think that the contemplative life is part of that, which we're going to practice 20 minutes in a little bit here, otherwise we'll never get out of it. So, um, the, uh, the mindfulness, because of the mindfulness of the mind, is you are able to notice your mind, because of observing the mind. You notice your mind... Uh, and you notice your mind, to be, and, and especially when you get this, all these thoughts coming, he says you begin to be aware, not that you're thinking, talking, or feeling, but you'll say, who is this that is thinking, talking, and feeling? And Jung might call it the superego. It's, it's from somebody else. You're not born in this world. 80 black people, or Mexicans, or people who speak another language. You're not taught it. You're not, you don't get born that way. It comes with your culture. It comes with your tribe. And I think what happens is you begin to realize that it's tribal thinking. You, have been, you become a tribal thinker. Uh, it's not your fault. You, this is where you grew up, this is what you were given, and you become a tribal thinker, and you're in, invited to become uh, something greater than, that your tribe can have a lot of good things to it. I can say, I'm an Irish background person, right? Irish American, Irish Catholic American. It has a lot to it, but some of that is a tribal pieces that uh, I need to begin to let go of. And so once you begin to find out in this meditation, you'll become, you'll be able to observe the mind and, and, and start to get beyond just the feeling of fear and say, whose voice is that? And you begin to find out that some, that is somebody else's voice. And you have taken on their persona, but it's not you. It might not even be that, but they didn't have a meditative life, so that's just the way they were, and that's what they passed on to you. No, we don't go there. No, we don't talk to these people. No, we don't do that. Uh, they're wrong, we're right, and so on and so forth. I grew up in an eight word in the Bronx, German and Irish. Met my first Italian when I was in the third grade. One, one Italian. Uh, and, uh, but that's the way it was. Years and years later, I read a book about the guy who owned the apartment buildings on our street. And I, I never thought about it. I didn't say I'm growing up German and, and Irish. And he said, that's who we ran into, the Germans and the Irish, who were moving up, up scale 
from the lower Bronx in Manhattan, which wasn't all that rich back then. And uh, they're making just enough money. They're moving up into nice little apartments in the North Bronx, Irish and uh, German. So you grow up, you don't marry an Italian. Irish don't marry Italians. So that's called a mixed marriage. <laughs> <laughs> And if, if you marry a non-Catholic, you should leave the church. If you go to a, a, a non-Catholic church, go inside of it, just go inside the front, mortal, mortal sin, confess, or you're murdered. This is the culture which I was brought up. And later on, some of these things you laugh at because they seem so obvious, but others is not too obvious. Some of it's just, you know, an angst. And you say, this is another voice. This is not really me. You begin to separate you from uh, the tribe, if you will. And this is one of the things he said, beware of who is thinking, talking, and feeling. So at some point, Thich Nhat Hanh is dealing with Buddhists who don't want to be involved in their culture in terms of making it a better world. Uh, and, uh, but he sees this as the way to go. And he carries us into uh, Western Europe, to Paris. He carries his Buddhism with this Western idea of being concerned about your neighbor. But how are you concerned about your neighbor? And I think what Buddhism brought to it is a way of being concerned about your neighbor without having it go your way. That sense of which